everyone. I'm Dr. Sayan Basu. I work at the Agri Prasad Eye Institute. And today I'm going to talk about how we can differentiate between severe dry eyes and severe ocular allergies. Now, before I go into the specifics, I would really recommend following reading for all of you. Um, these are four seminal publications. Three of them are in the Ocular Surface Journal, which is one of the premier ophthalmology research journals. And one is in the journal called Current Opinion in Allergy and Clinical Immunology. Two of them talk about dry eye disease in India, in adults, as well as in children. And two of them talk about allergic eye disease in India, um, particularly in children and adolescents. Um, these are the, uh, I've provided you with the details of the four publications and uh, you will be able to find these very easily on uh, the internet. And I would highly recommend that if you want to really learn about how to differentiate between these conditions and so on and so forth, read these four articles. Okay, with that having said, and I hope that you'll be able to go through the recommended reading that I just suggested, uh, I will go on to the actual topic. Now, why do we have this confusion? So why are we talking about how to differentiate between allergy and dry eye in the first place? Why are people getting confused between the two? What is common? What is different? And how do we differentiate? Okay. So first, we will talk about what is common. So as you clearly understand, both of these diseases are ocular surface disorders, which means that these are problems that affect the surface of the eye. Dry eye disease is an abnormality of the tear film. And therefore, the tear film, as you know, is a very important part of the ocular surface. And the ocular allergy is also a form of conjunctivitis. And the conjunctiva is also a part, very important part, of the ocular surface. The other commonality that uh, these two disorders have is that they are commonly, almost always bilateral, but the presentation can be asymmetrical, which means that you may have more severe involvement or affliction on one side and the other side may be relatively less affected. But usually, if you care to look closely, you will find that patients, if the diagnosis is correct, that patients actually have allergy or actually have um, dry eye disease, that the disease is bilateral. Although, like I mentioned before, the presentation may be asymmetrical, that one eye may be less or more affected than the other. The other commonality is that the, both of these are chronic diseases. So they start at a certain point of time in the lives of the patients who are affected by them. Um, sometimes they remain dormant for a really long time without really increasing or decreasing in severity. And then after a point in time, things go a little bit downhill. But most of these diseases are chronic and sometimes they can have a waxing and waning course, which means that, uh, you know, the severity can increase and decrease with time. But like I said before, both of these diseases are chronic, meaning that once they have onset, the duration of the disease is long. The other confusion, particularly for patients who have been suffering for a long time and then present to you after a certain period of time, is the fact that uh, a lot of them are on similar medications. So a lot of them would be using topical lubricants or topical steroids off and on. So it is sometimes very difficult to make out whether they are, what are they using these medications for and what is the diagnosis based on what medications they were using before. It's very difficult to differentiate based on that because some of the medications they use are very similar. And the last and very important point being that both these conditions, because they are ocular surface disorders and because they are chronic, 
and difficult to treat sometimes or not adequately treated very often, particularly in our country, that over a period of time, patients, the main problem that these patients encounter or that they face, um, the main problem is, you know, progressive keratopathy or corneal disease. So a lot of them present with corneal complications like ulcers or, you know, necrosis of the cornea, vascularization, scarring, and even corneal perforation red. So you can understand from this slide that there is a fair amount of overlap in terms of the various characteristics of both diseases. They're both ocular surface disorders. They are very commonly bilateral. They are chronic diseases. Patients have been suffering for a long time. And they usually give a history of a disease which has been increasing and decreasing in severity over time often are using the same types of medications, typically lubricants and steroids, and they often present in the severe stage of the diseases with corneal complications. Having said that now, I will try to weed out what are the specific differences between these two conditions so that if a patient presents to you, how would you go about differentiating and making the correct diagnosis? But the premise here, of course, is the fact that um, you otherwise would know what is the definition of ocular allergy and what is the definition of dry eye disease. And I will touch upon it in a small way during the course of my talk. But this is something like the articles that I pointed to, alluded to at the beginning of my talk, are things that you should definitely go through to get a deeper understanding of how these diseases are defined, what is their pathophysiology, and so on and so forth. Now, these two graphs that you see are from the papers that I uh, showed you initially. On top is the graph of the frequency distribution of patients with allergic conjunctivitis. And uh, on the y-axis, you can see the percentages. And on the x-axis, you can see the age groups. Okay. So remember then on top, this is allergy. And at the bottom, this is the frequency distribution for dry eye. So one of the curves is for males. The other curve is for females. The colors are the same. The lighter curve or the lighter line is females and the darker line is males. At the bottom, you have the frequency distribution of patients with dry eye disease. Now, what do these two curves tell you? So on top, uh, you see the allergy curve where my pointer is pointing at or indicating. And you see that allergy usually starts in this age group of three to five year old. Okay. And it reaches a peak. So most of the patients that you will see with ocular allergy are between the ages of six and 11 and also between the ages of 12 and 18. So it starts here. It peaks around just prepubertal or pre-adolescent age group, it persists through adolescence. And then you can see a rapid tapering off by the time they reach late adolescence or they become young adults. So it is very clear from this demographic distribution or frequency distribution of the percentage of patients presenting with ocular allergy that it is mainly a disease of middle childhood to early adolescence. Okay. In according to the American Academy of Pediatrics, uh, these age groups are classified as such. Okay, So early childhood is where it starts, middle childhood is where it really peaks, and early adolescence is where it starts to taper off. And then in late adolescence and young adulthood, there is usually nothing. It comes back to baseline which basically tells you that ocular allergy is essentially a disease of childhood and adolescence. This is very, very important to understand. Yes, you can rarely find adults with ocular allergy, but that is the exception rather than the rule. So most patients with ocular allergy will present in middle childhood, in the pre-adolescence age group and 
many of them will have a chronic course through adolescence, but towards the end of adolescence, towards the end of the pubertal period, they will start to get better. So therefore, another important point that this chart tells you is that it is a self-limiting disease. And it is chronic. Yes, it starts at here around the three to five year age group. But by the time the patient is into, you know, late adolescence and early adulthood, the disease has tapered off and is no longer that prevalent or that problematic. And like I said, you might find once in a while a patient who is an adult and has ocular allergy, but that is the exception rather than the rule. Whereas if you look at the graph at the bottom, which is the graph for dry eye disease, it's very different. Now you can understand that the scale is not the same. And the graph for the allergy graph on top, it goes from birth to about 21 years of age because there's no point in plotting this graph after this because the prevalence is so, or the frequency of patients presenting after that is so low. Whereas if you look at the dry eye graph, you will see that there is hardly any dry eye in childhood or even in adolescence. It's only in late adolescence that you start seeing dry eye. And most of this is because of myomine gland dysfunction. And if you read our paper on pediatric dry eyes in India, uh, which is going to be out in the ocular surface in the next few weeks, uh, you will it, it gives a very nice description of what are the causes of dry eye disease in childhood and they're very different from the causes of dry eye disease in, and it is mostly in adolescence that you see dry eye and that continues in the young adults between the ages of 20 and 30 as predominantly myomian gland disease related evaporative dry eye because of excess screen time and so on and so forth. you also see here that although the peaks for the males, which is the darker color here, and the females, which is the lighter color here, are different, which means that most patients, most females with dry eye with, will present with that condition around the perimenopausal age, whereas most males with dry eye disease will present with this disease in young adulthood. Okay, so between the ages of 20 and 40, not so much later on. However, the graph clearly tells you that the bulk of the cases of dry eye disease are in adults. So this is a clear cut difference from what you see in allergy. So allergy, you can see a very self-limiting curve. It goes up and then it comes, out, comes down around uh, late childhood, early adulthood. And then you hardly see allergy after that. Whereas in dry eye disease, you hardly see it early on and then most of the patients affected with dry eye are concentrated in early, middle and you know late adulthood. So there is a very clear demographic difference here. The other uh, important thing is that you see that uh, the in males it is peaking at a different time but the peaks of males and females more or less coincide in dry eye disease, which means that although many studies have shown that there is a higher, slightly higher prevalence of dry eye disease in uh, females, more or less because of the compensation of the higher prevalence of dry eye disease in young adults, in, in uh, young adult males, it kind of compensates. So if you look at the overall distribution, you will find that in dry eye disease, it is more or less 50-50. So it's very equal. Whereas if you look at allergy, you find that the peak uh, for males is much higher and uh, it is much more common in males than in uh, female children. Okay, So that's also a very, very clear difference. And this is basically the next chart that I want to show you that clearly demonstrates that. So this is a prevalence chart. Okay. Uh, as opposed to uh, uh, the frequency distribution, which was before. What it shows you here again, and I, am, I want to indicate here that the uh, x-axis is different. In the allergy graph, the x-axis is only in ch childhood and adolescence, whereas in dry eye disease, it goes right across all age groups. And like I mentioned, because this is basically because of the fact that there is very little allergy 
in adulthood after adolescence. Now, what this graph again tells you is that the male graph in allergy is way beyond the graph for the females, which means that boys, young boys, adolescent males are much more likely to have allergy than young girls or adolescent females. Whereas if you look at the dry eye graph, you find that it is very, it is basically running neck to neck, which means that the prevalence in, uh, it has different peaks, sure, but uh, it is more or less very, very similar. So, you know, the chances that you will see a male patient with dry eye disease versus a female patient with dry eye disease at any random time point in your clinic is roughly the same, okay? So for every female patient with dry eye that you will see, you will also see a male patient with dry eye. Yes, there will be a little bit of difference in the demographic in the sense that most of the male patients who will come with dry eye disease will be younger. Most patients with, most women with dry eye disease who will come to your clinic will be older. But otherwise, uh, in terms of numbers, they will be roughly equal. But unlike dry eye disease, in allergy, for every female patient that you see with ocular allergy, for every young girl who comes in with allergy, you will see at least two times the number of boys. Okay, So if you see one girl, you will see two boys. Uh, that's kind of, you know, the, the relative frequency or prevalence is much higher in boys uh, rather than in girls. And this is uh, related to, uh, there is a theory that it is related to the amount of testosterone um, and there is a some immunomodulation that testosterone does to, to control allergy and the lack of it and therefore boys are more affected than girls and so on. So, so this is another important difference. So I showed you these two graphs and uh, to demonstrate two points. One is that allergy is a disease of childhood and adolescence whereas dry eyes is mostly a disease of adulthood. One clear difference, okay? Now, like I mentioned, exceptionally, you may find an adult with allergy. Exceptionally, you might find a child with dry eye, but these are exceptions and exceptions prove the rule. So remember that allergy is a disease of childhood and adolescence. Dry eye disease is a disease of adulthood. 